Hello and welcome to this special episode of Ladies Talking Business. I am your host, Irene Ubani, and here with me is my co-host, Morimi Ako, and our guest for today is a delectable business entrepreneur and a coach. She was recently listed by Forbes as one of the top most powerful 50 women in Africa. She is the CEO of House of Tara International and was also mentioned as one of the young global leaders by the World Economic Forum. She's no other person than Tara Fela Dutoi. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank Certainly. You, very much. you are definitely one to be reckoned with. Uh -oh. What makes Tara, Tara? Hmm. Um, hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I think from a personal standpoint, um, I'm someone who's living, wants to live a life of purpose, um, a life of impact, a life that empowers others. And I think that has also reflected into the business model that House of Tara has created. Uh, one of our core values as a business is empowerment. And the reason why is because it's also a reflection of the things that I'm passionate about. It's reflective of my values as a person. So everything that we do at House of Tara, it's focused around empowerment, it's focused around impact, um, it's focused around ensuring that the continent is better. Uh, so our vision is to be a globally respected beauty company of African origin. So Africa is in our framework, um, impact is in our framework, empowerment is also in our framework. And how, how was the vision birthed? Um, so I started as a bridal makeup artist, as, as many people know, um, going from house to house. Obviously, uh, wedding is a big thing in Nigeria. Uh, we have, for everyone who's getting married, at multiple levels. You know, mm -hmm. you have your introduction, you actually have your <laughs> traditional marriage, then you have your white wedding, and then you have a night party when your in-laws come and take you. So, you know, it, it, it was birthed out of a place where um, brides wanted someone who could dress them up on their wedding day, and really, really, it's really about doing the makeup for them and I started a business doing that but as, as the business began to grow it you know there was a lot of evolution that took place and evolution around uh, what more are the customers looking for what more do the brides want uh, I, we found out that our brides moved from just uh, bridal customers to everyday customers who wanted products um, our customers also evolved to people who were at the wedding who mm -hmm saw me do the makeup of the bride and had interest in becoming makeup artists, wanting to train and learn. Uh, we also had people who um, also wanted a product that was, that was um, right for them, their skin color, uh, considering the temperature of, of, uh, of our environment, the weather of Nigeria. And so the evolution came as a result of what the customers and the consumers were now responding to wanting, to desiring. And, 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 and so moving from bridal makeup artistry to then become building a business where we have, a tra we have training schools and we've succeeded in, in training more than half of the makeup artists who are in the industry today mm -hmm. uh, with 19 centers across the country from Kaduna to Port Harcourt, mm -hmm. from Port Harcourt to Ibado or to Ilori and to Enugu and training people and churning out people who could start their own businesses as bridal makeup artists. But then also as, as they go out to start their businesses, they needed products. Right, and yes. we created our own line of products. So we have Tara range. We have almost 300 um, SKUs in our entire range of products, from powders to foundations, eyeshadows to lipsticks. Um, but also, in terms of empowering them, we now start to train them how to not just build a skill as a as a makeup artist, but also to be, start a trade where you are you are selling your products to your customers, because that's, that's exactly what happened with me. And then making and um, um, increasing your income by also not just being a bridal makeup artist, but actually having products that you could sell to your customers. And so our business began to grow from not just the school, but also creating a marketing model or a sales model where we have empowered over 15,000 young women across the country who are trading in the tire products across in different parts of the country. Interesting. It's amazing because I can remember that from right from when I was in University. law school, I yep. saw people actually yep. do what you talk about. Oh, yes. I sell Tara products. Yes. Oh, I sell Tara yes. products yes. and I get commission. Yes. But that's yes. fantastic. Yeah. So let's talk about influence. Were yes. your parents um, entrepreneurs in any way? Did that influence that entrepreneurship mm -hmm. spirit in you? Mm -hmm. No, not at all. My father was civil servant and so was my mom. Um, but I think what was interesting was um, I was intrigued by, by the response that the society gave to because obviously I was a pioneer bridal makeup artist in Nigeria mm -hmm. people were fascinated by that as, as something that I was doing and so the influence didn't really come from my parents because my parents were not entrepreneurial in any way both both of them were actively working for the for the government my mom was a civil servant my father was also a civil, civil servant the question is who did I see 
that was an entrepreneur that I wanted to mirror. There was no, there was someone who came, a very famous Nigerian entrepreneur called Victor uh, Victor Oshibodu, and and at the time he was well still is, but obviously the chairman of the company now founded a company called Video, and it was more of a corporate corporate I think product company. And he came to my secondary school to talk about his entrepreneurial journey, right? Mm -hmm. And at the time, people were not planning to become entrepreneurs. There were more people who were fascinated by being lawyers, yeah, doctors, doctors, and what have you. I listened to him. I, I can't remember what he said, but all I took away from an inspiration to want to be, to want to do, to want to create a brand, because what he did was to talk about his business, but there was a lot of focus around the brand that he had built. And I think that that's, that was the seed that was sown uh, on my entrepreneurial journey at that early stage. Mm -hmm. Now, I see you talking about, you know, this entire journey of yours. We understand that you grew up under the tutelage of your stepmother. How did that influence your decisions and choices up until today? Mm -hmm. So um, my stepmom was an amazing woman. And this one, one of the things I always say, sometimes you find a, a situation where you are married to someone who's already had, who's already had children, um, and whether he's a widow or divorced, whatever, you have the opportunity to be impactful right, in the life of the children who are, who are in that house today. And sometimes we take that for granted. I was someone who I believe really, really benefited from having a stepmother who my dad married, right, and, and she raised me and she did an amazing job, unfortunately, passed away uh, uh, many years ago. But amazing. And, uh, she studied fine arts. Um, and so she loved the arts. She loved gardening. Uh, my father used to call her upstairs farmer. Because <laughs> every balcony in every home that we lived in always had plants and flowers. Um, she was extremely stylish, very fashion forward. She loved to read. Um, she loved to cook. She was a thorough homemaker. But I think what was most fascinating about her that I came to realize as I grew older was she was an amazing wife. Mm -hmm. and, and some of those things you learn by, by association, not necessarily by what she was teaching. And I think to a large extent, her desire for uh, a radiant life, her desire for plants, flowers, uh, care, beauty. kindness, mm -hmm. beauty, uh, fine arts, because I mean, makeup artistry is really about the art. Oh. We're part of the things, her love for Adire and, and the prints, uh, because she used to make Adire at home for chair covers, for, you know, table mats, uh, for dressing, everything. And, and I think that those are the things that shaped my desire for a fuller life. So for me, life is beyond my business. Life is more family but also nature and all the little things that that can make life fun and amazing colors and those are the things that i think i picked up from her but also the role of an amazing wife in the life of a man and, and that's another thing i picked up from her mm. wonderful yes. <laughs> yeah. okay so the house of tara is now a very mega brand yes. in africa mm -hmm. so how were you able to expand to have so many branches mm -hmm. and at what points did you know that okay it's time for us to expand so um our expansion uh strategy was born, born out of a franchise model and a distributorship model so distributors distributorship model and a franchise model franchise model for us it's we have a retail operation system that people wanted um to buy but also they we had a brand name that they also wanted to buy and that's one of the things strategies for our expansion so we're able to expand to other other places beyond our first store our second store because we had people who were interested in our franchise and, and that's how we expanded uh distributorship model like you said um i wasn't in law school with you but somebody was talking about tara mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and through that model it, it, you can expand micro uh, from a micro standpoint uh where you are doing consumer to consumer where you're doing um, where you're doing one-on-one -on -one direct marketing. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody who's in your, your school is talking to you, somebody who works in your office is talking to you, someone who goes to your church is talking to you. That was one strategy for, for the distributorship model. But then also for the franchise is, I'm going to open a retail store that is going to be called the House of Tara that would do exactly the same thing any other House of Tara would be doing. And what we were essentially doing is replicating a retail operation system that currently works. And that's for us was our expansion strategy. And what's your take on consumerism and in terms of business structure? Because we realize that for some business owners, when the founder either dies or doesn't have interest in that business anymore, mm -hmm. it feels like that's the end of the business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what exactly is it for mm -hmm. the Tara brand? It's interesting how you called me a coach earlier on. It's very interesting because <laughs> right? like, I've never called myself out. But I think the reason why people call me a coach is because I'm very passionate about ensuring that my business outlives me and then businesses that are upcoming 
who who are not as many, you know, I, I've done this for 23 years, right? And the people who are doing it for 10 years, or people who are eight years, what can you put in place today to ensure that your business outlives you? So I'm very passionate about that subject. I've done a lot of study around African, big African entrepreneurs who have not outlived their businesses. Some of them died and the businesses ended. I mean, recently read an article that was written uh, by Time Magazine in 1958 about the, what, what the, the title was self-made millionaires of, of Nigeria. And many of them had mega businesses with franchises from all the, some of the most important brands till, that we know till today. And some of those brands were created before Ralph Lauren, before Walmart, mm -hmm. and, Walmart um, and, and Pizza Hut, like the American brands. But those brands don't exist anymore. Um, so you, know, you now hear of the, about the people who founded the companies, but you've never heard about those businesses anymore. And so for me, it's such a passion that we need to build businesses that are sustainable. And why? Because we have some serious social issues across the continent around unemployment. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why we continue to have unemployment is if, if we don't have businesses that not only grow, but are sustained over, over multiple years, mm -hmm. right? So the minute that business ends, jobs are lost. New jobs cannot even be created when those businesses begin to expand. So government can never employ enough people for us. And, and so every one of us who have small businesses needs to think about how do we build our businesses to become medium scale businesses so that we can begin to employ 200, 300 people. And this problem that we have as a continent of unemployment and a, a, with such a strong youth and, and uh, population can be changed. And it's my passion. This is, and one of the greatest ways to do that is by building systems and building structure. Structure systems is what we need as a continent to build businesses that are sustainable in the long term. Now, and from your research, what have you found over time that those businesses that have stayed and, you know, stayed through this time and have excelled, what were those things that they got right? Um, um, a, f a few of them, a few of them I, would, I, I think so from the top of my head is really have strong leadership, right? It was, it's one of the gaps also as a continent, and strong leadership and, and leadership in terms of not just management, but how do we lead our companies? How do we lead our people? Um, that's one. The two, second one is innovation. Um, we need to be able to look at our customers and be sensitive enough to know what the customers are asking for, uh, what do they need. And so for us, I, when I think about our evolution as a business, there were times where our customers sent us messages. And messages not necessarily sometimes in what they said, but how they were responding. And the sensitivity of that is part of the reasons why you can then create innovative products that become satisfying. But I think lastly is building processes. We don't have a culture where, um, for example, how does your mother cook a particular soup? You mm -hmm. know, when your mother's soup is cooked, can your sister cook the same soup and it takes exactly the same like your mother? Very unlikely. That's happened all the time. The reason why is because we're not taught to use measurements, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Teaspoon. How many? Te if I ask you, how many teaspoons of salt do you use? You say you don't know. You just sprinkle, sprinkle. sprinkle. and you just <laughs> know, right? Right? And that's a culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, but Auntie Jemima syrup is now being sold in Nigeria. The reason why is because somebody had a recipe. Auntie Jemima's recipe was taught by, was, was learned by somebody That's else who mm -hmm. then created a product and today that product has been scaled across the continent. So it's about processes. What are processes? What are the step-by-step -step, um, steps that we're taking every day to, to ensure that we have the same result and outcome, consistent outcomes? Mm -hmm. And so innovation, strong leadership, and building systems in our businesses such that the outcomes are the same every time. All right, we'll take a quick break um, and please stay with us. You're still watching Ladies Talking Business on Plus TV Africa. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you are watching Ladies Talking Business on Plus TV Africa. And I guess for today is somebody I admire so much. It's still Tara Fela Dorotoye. Let's talk about integrity in running a business in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It is key. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about some of your experiences in mm -hmm. terms of integrity, maybe from people to you or mm -hmm. from you towards people? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a bit of a... It's a Based on, from a personal standpoint and then from a business standpoint. Personal standpoint in terms of being a person who integrity is really about keeping to your word. So you say something and you do it. And sometimes as an employer of labor, um, sometimes you make commitments um, to the employees and to the company as a whole. And then you find out that you're stuck in a, in a, in a, in a rut. And then the question is, should you stay with what you've already promised? Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it becomes a, a question of integrity where 
I'm not able to. And so there are times where I've reminded myself, well, you've said so, so therefore you have to do so, um, even though it's not. Ever. And then there are moments where I feel like uh, people took advantage of the company, for example, but then we put a policy in place that ensures that somebody can take advantage of that policy. And unfortunately, I, I can see that the person taking advantage of the policy, but nothing to be done because we've already committed to it. Uh, as, and these are some of the things that we talk about when we're building structure. You know, I, I run a, a master class with entrepreneurs. And one of the things I do is to say, well, when those, you don't create policies when there's a crisis, right? You sort out that, you don't change a policy when there's a crisis. You, you allow that policy to fly. And then after that, you can begin to think about ways to adjust the policy. But if somebody, if you've said, for example, people, have, people can date, like you've said, uh, employees can date while they're working in your organization and then something happens where two people are dating and you feel the company's at risk because of that then you want to change the policy you can't change the policy right uh -huh. until subsequently right and and so these are some of the things that I've seen from integrity standpoints another issue is around for example running stores across the country where in different cities have different things people come and say oh well we are local government or we are semi-local government mm -hmm. and they want to take this and they want to take advantage of of businesses because they feel we don't have enough knowledge and and the team knows that we don't offer bribes and we would never offer a bribe or rather um we suffer for it i mean i've had situations where we've, we've been taken to somewhere in lagos state for example to say oh you have to uh, because you haven't done this, you have to do this. And the question is for me is, can I pay a bribe? Yes, somebody could tell you that this is an easy way out, but I'd rather not do that because also it's an example that I'm trying to set um, mm -hmm. as an owner of an organization, as a leader within my community. Um, so it's, a, in, in, it's an interesting question to ask because it's a, it's a real crisis here, yeah. a crisis of values as a people. And mm -hmm. I think it's going to take us one after the other to, t to, to do what we have to do on a personal level for that to change. So if I run an organization that has 300 employees and people know that I insist that we must do things right, then those who leave the organization to start up their own businesses sometimes carry away those values mm -hmm. and we can have a potential ripple effect of it. Yes. Now, in terms of financial management, because I feel like it's also very, it's tied, it's intertwined with the issue of integrity. Mm -hmm. Now, you have been able to come up with other branches across Nigeria and across Africa as well. This requires a level of you know, fin financial stability. Have you been able to grow that mm -hmm. while managing the issue of integrity? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think, um, so I, I haven't had a situation where uh, growth for us is dependent on our single customers buying. It's not dependent on a government, for example. Our growth mm -hmm. is not dependent on an institution. Um, as long as you run a business that, it, that you, you're, you are, you are, you are at a key man risk when your customer is maybe one institution, then that, that affects you. But for us, it's ordinary African women who, are, who just want a lipstick and who want an eyeshadow, who want a powder that suits them, and they come and buy our brand. It is, it is those women, and there's so many of them that I don't know personally who are, who are making choices. They are the ones who are giving the company the financial capacity to be able to expand. Um, anyone who's buying our franchise, what the person is basically saying is I'm paying for your brand name and I'm paying for the brand that you've built. That is, gives us capacity to continue to expand um, uh, organically. And I think that's really about our consumers constantly buying the product because they're proud of the product. They're proud of the quality of the product, but mm -hmm. also it's about um, franchises, you know, buying more and more franchises and therefore giving us the potential to expand. So talking about the products, um, you've been running this business for many years. In your own perspective, would you say that Nigerians, or would I say Africans, mm -hmm. have embraced our local products mm -hmm. than foreign products? Um, so when, when I first started, that, this was a question, are Nigerians really ready? Um, and I was shocked. I was shocked because the first product I started with was makeup brushes. And it was really for makeup artists. And, but I did a, a launch, and, and at the launch, People were surprised that it was just brushes. They were actually expecting lipsticks and powders. Between that time and now, which is almost 20 years, right, I've seen a significant growth in the interest of Africans for Africa, right? Um, I remember when we launched in Kenya, the reception that we received as a brand um, at the time was a reflection that Africans were already ready. As much as we still have, we have entrance of international brands into the market, but the local brands have, be have begun to compete 
at the same level as international brands, which I find to be um, totally amazing. But it has come as a result of the evolution in the industry, the participation of makeup artists. I mean, now what we've done as, as an industry is makeup artists have, have triggered the interest Mm. of the consumers by teaching them what is possible by doing those YouTube videos yes. by doing the Instagram lives mm -hmm. by showing mm -hmm. the step-by-step -step, you know quick makeup five minutes makeup every time the makeup artists are doing that they're be, they're they're changing the culture and by changing the culture people become more interested so if makeup artists are saying I'm using Tara then the consumers want to use Tara, Tara as well of course mm -hmm. and we see that you are very vested in training young leaders mm -hmm. particularly ladies mm -hmm. What, what inspires you to do all of this? Uh, it, it, I, I do that because I'm also someone who, who's been, you know, they say to whom much is given, much is required. Um, I have been, I'm one who other women have invested in, other women have given their time and their mentorship and their sponsorship. And I feel like I have to pay it forward. So it's come out of, of a place course. of paying it forward. Um, give and it shall be given back to you. So for me, it's I need to give it. Um, I owe it to give it. I'm blessed so that I can be a blessing. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that pushes me, gives me the desire to do so. And impact is so, such an integral, and I said at the very beginning, impact and empowerment is such an integral part of who I am in fulfilling my purpose. Mm -hmm. And so there's a purpose element, but there's also a people have invested in you and it's time for you, you to pay it forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. Great, great, wonderful. Um, is it, well, we can say that young people now struggle between knowing what to do so okay i want to be a lawyer today i want to be a beauty entrepreneur tomorrow i want to be a, a journalist the day after mm. so what's your take on transitioning especially mm. for young people what's mm. your, what's your advice what would you say about not knowing what to do um i, I don't think that's new i don't think it's a young people's thing i mean, just telling that story mm, i remember notes. yes I, I think i know someone who's you know there are few people who who knew what they wanted to do and then they went straight in and they've never changed. There are a few people like that, but I know more people who have gone through evolutions and old, women who are older than me who have gone through evolutions. Uh, and then those who haven't gone through that evolution in terms of changing a career path. And so I would say, well, calm down, right? <laughs> um, you have time. Um, okay. I remember Mrs. Awishika's story, starting off as an accountant, right? And then studying chemistry and then going to be ac doing accounting and working in a, an accounting firm and then moving on from there to now owning a furniture, furniture company mm -hmm. and then building so many companies at the same time now chairman of, of the largest okay. uh, bank in, in the continent. So um, I think that that evolution is real um, and I think that people just need to find what their purpose is and your purpose is at the time where you, where you currently are. What is it that inspires you? And I think that my counsel also is let's not be so driven by what others are doing what mm. I am supposed to be doing. And if you focus on what you're supposed to be doing, you would know instinctively. And if you know instinctively, have the courage to do it, even if it's not accept, uh, if, 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 even if it's not sexy. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that bit. So yeah. what would you say to that young entrepreneur who wants to start off his or her business at this point in time mm. and is listening to you? I would say look for solutions. Um, you know, mm. the, those who solve big problems make big money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So look for solutions, look for solutions, solutions that no one has thought about or have, ha, have not leveraged um, and work on that. The, the Nigerian youth are brilliant, absolutely brilliant, oh, innovative, uh, creative. And let's, let's bring that to bear and solve some of our social issues as a continent and as a country. And if we do so, then people will pay big money for solving big problems. Certainly. Tara Fela Durotoye, it was a pleasure having you on our program today. Thank you very much. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all on Ladies Talking Business on this special episode. For those of you who joined us, thank you so much. From me, Irene Bani, it's a thank you. And, and from me, host. it's a thank you as well. <laughs> Until next time, bye. <laughs>